So let me start with the project that I've started here at EPFL uh, two years ago in the lab of Professor Dillonbourg and that project that you've seen today in the Martins Vitterly talk. Uh, it also brought me to deep learning and it also brought some attention to myself and to this, this work. So let's first look at the image here. You all know that this was painted by Vincent van Gogh, right? Why do you know that? Because you, we can recognize features such as colors, characteristic colors, characteristic uh, patterns, brush strokes. You can see that it's an expressionist style, so you're, you're sure that it must be Vincent van Gogh, right? Well, surprise, surprise, it's actually, it was painted by my computer within an hour. I just gave this image as input and I got this Van Gogh painting, right? You can ask, well, how, how the hell is possible? It's, it's, it's magic. Uh, well, let, let me briefly explain how the algorithm works. It's based on so-called convolutional neural networks that you've heard about here a few times. So the convolutional neural nets were used to and are still used for image recognition. And how does it work? It works more or less how it works in your brain when you recognize a face or some, some object. So you're looking for certain patterns. You are looking for eyes, you're looking for a nose, you're looking for mouth. And then you ignore all the other information because that's enough for you to, to figure out that's the face. The same the algorithm does. So it ignores this low-level texture textures, uh, low-level information. Now, we made a little twist on top of this algorithm. And we said to the algorithm, hey, algorithm, you remember this face that I showed you? Please create an image with the same high-level features of, an, of a face, but replace those low-level heat features, like textures, such that it's still recognizable, but has low-level features from a different image. That's the result we got, one of the results. Of course, it works not only with faces, it works with Eiffel Towers as well. Uh, and uh, since uh, I was honored to be presented in the morning session, I took the liberty to also quickly update my slides. It works also with uh, Martin Viderli. Here's another example. Uh, and one more. So as you can see, it's a very exciting project. And uh, two years ago, we started a website called deepart.io that you can all go in now and uh, test, or preferably after the talk, or after all the talks. Uh, but so, so the website is still maintained. We are still accepting images. We processed over uh, 2 million images. But we also moved on with our research, and especially me and Michal, who is also uh, here in the, in the room, we moved more to the biomedical research. Uh, and we started working on problems uh, which are maybe a little bit less fun, but uh, important for humanity, as you've seen in the IELTS talk uh, before. So let me talk about the biomedical research and how similar techniques can be used for, for curing diseases. So many of you are not familiar with how uh, healthcare works, or you've never been a doctor. So let's play a simple game, or like let's, let's do a simple mental exercise. Let's imagine that every single person in this room is a medical doctor. You just received your MD, PhD degree from Stanford, why not? Uh, and you're about, you, you got your job at Stanford's hospital. This is your office from now on. And you're about to see your first patient. You're an orthopedic surgeon to make, thing, to make things harder. So you're about to see your first patient. The patient comes with her mom. The mom approaches you and says, uh, hello, doctor, here is Julie. Julie is six years old. She has troubles with walking and running. She cannot keep up with her peers. Uh, please help us. Uh, we, have, uh, we have great insurance policy. You're still in the US, so that's, that's your life. Uh, that's how it looks right now. So yeah, well, you, you first ask Julie to walk across the room, as you normally do. So here's, here's Julie. And you can directly recognize some patterns. So she lands on her toes. She has asymmetric gait uh, pattern. You recognize that these are the features of diseases that you are familiar with uh, from, your, from your knowledge from school. And you want to help this child. So how do you do that? And you have, you, you're a researcher as well. So you know that in order to take good, intelligent decisions, you should first collect the data. Then you want to model the data. 
and then you take some predictions. So um, what I will try to show you today is that we can very dramatically improve every single step of this procedure uh, using machine learning techniques, deep learning. As I all showed you in the previously that we can improve data collection, I, sh I will show you some other parts of that as well. But let's start with data collection in this particular case. So what will normally happen in, uh, in this scenario is that now you will ask Julie to go to a so-called gate lab, where a physical therapist will put markers all over the body of Julie. Uh, you don't see the markers here, but they're there on the legs. And you, they will ask Julie to walk across the room again. But now they're, they're, the room is filled with uh, high-frequency cameras that collect data at very high frequency, at very high resolution, and know exactly how Julie is moving. Now, since we know how she is moving, we can produce some graphs of this movement. So basically, what we are interested in is how the joints bend in different directions. So we have four joints of interest, three planes. You can imagine that we, we can produce graphs based on this movement. And now, this is very typical for orthopedic surgeons and in this field. Uh, you, as, as a doctor, you all know uh, that mm, certain patterns here are related to certain diseases, and you know how to treat that. So that's, that's your pipeline for now. Now, it sounds great, no? We collect the data, we are, we are smart, we, we have an expert who takes the decision, but uh, there are a few flaws here uh, that I will uh, try to go through and show you how we can improve that significantly. So first, the equipment is super expensive. So for, for those cameras, you pay $100,000. $100, so only a few clinics, even in the US, can afford that. And in poor countries, it's, it's just not data-driven because they don't have data. You need an engineer to start a system, to stop a system, to run the pipeline, to design the pipeline. It's, again, a, a huge cost and also limited time of, of an engineer for, for running these sessions. You need, you need a physical therapist for putting these markers on the body. That, of course, can cause some bias because if you put markers in the wrong place, uh, you will collect corrupt data. Corrupt data means corrupt decisions. That's, that's wrong. Finally, you have a controlled lab environment. So even though you have your uh, data collected, it's data on walking in the lab. It's not the data on how we actually move. So all these problems could be actually, um, well, we could, we could improve the entire pipeline if we had a method to get information directly from here. Because you as a doctor, you know and that in the video, there is a lot of information. So you, you've seen that she lands on her toes and so on. So imagine that, that we have a mobile device or just, that you just take out your mobile from, from your pocket, you record your child with, with a camera, you press the button, and you extract all the meaningful medical information right away. You get your pre-diagnosis, then you send the child to the hospital, or you can then track the child after the surgery, which normally doesn't happen because it's too expensive to actually come to the clinic often. So doctors actually don't even know what happens after the surgery. So if we had this data collection technique, we could dramatically change how we actually deal with movement disorders. The problem is that we cannot extract information from video, right? Well, wrong again. It's changed dramatically in the recent years. So with deep neural networks, and with the algorithm here, it's the algorithm called, algorithm called Open Pose, which extracts positions of joints in an image. Since it, extracts, since it works for images, we can apply it to a video. And now we know how the joints move throughout the video. It's not as accurate as the motion capture that I showed you with expensive cameras. But now with just a commodity camera, we can still collect signals, maybe a bit weaker, but still give us a lot. We can track progress after the surgery. So, what I'm working on at Stanford is this is just a building block of the algorithm that I'm developing for extracting meaningful information for a doctor to take um, decisions just without this super expensive equipment and PT and an engineer. Now, OK, so the data collection can be, can be improved. I hope I convinced you. How about data modeling? So that's, more, that's a more technical uh, project that I'm working on at Stanford again with, uh, with my advisor, uh, with Trevor Hasty. We are trying to develop methods to understand disease progressions. So now imagine that you have patients coming to the clinic like three times in their life. So they, they came once, second time, and third time. At the third time, you want to predict how their certain parameter of their disease will change in time after, after that. So since you have just one patient, it would be really hard. You would just guess what will happen. 
But if you have a huge body of, of, uh, um, of subjects in your database, you could try to find another patient who was in similar situation for the last two years and maybe extrapolate from that. So we are using methods similar to what Amazon is doing, uh, where you have based on similar patterns of uh, users in an in Amazon store, you recommend something to, do the, to the user. So we mapped this medical problem to a recommender system setting, and out of the sudden, we got a nice uh, solution for, for predicting trajectory, so suggesting the trajectory that is most likely to happen to you. But that's, OK, so th those are techniques. Like the, the very, it's actually very close to what Christopher Bishop was also showing and researching uh, around uh, 15 years ago. Now, all those techniques are great, but you know that machine learning has one significant disadvantage, that it's always or very often it's based on the data that you, are have, that you have. So we are looking for patterns in the data, so we are biased by design to the data that we have. So it, to come back to the medical context that we had in a, sec a few seconds ago, Imagine that you have a surgeon who applies like, his favorite surgery all the time to, the, to, to all the children in the clinic. It's, it sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, just by the fact that you have a lot of samples on, on this particular treatment in your data, you will sort of bias your decisions towards this surgeon who is not necessarily uh, innovative enough. So he's really old-fashioned surgeon, let's say. How can, we, how can we remedy this issue? I believe that we can use techniques that Raya was showing in her talk, uh, reinforcement learning techniques. So let me come back to the challenge that we created that I was talking about yesterday. Uh, I will go through how the challenge looked, what, what was it about for people who didn't come yesterday, uh, and then I will tell you very briefly how this can be applied to, um, to exploring new possibilities in the hospital. So the challenge was about this, that we had a skeleton with muscles, uh, and bones, and we are asking people to control the skeleton uh, to walk as fast as possible. That was the, the setting. You can see that we didn't really, uh, at the beginning, it did something meaningful, but that wasn't really yet there. After a while, we, had, we are arriving at something more meaningful. Uh, it turns out that the very common reference to, to what we are having here was the <laughs> Ministry of Silly Walks. <laughs> That's, everybody was mentioning this when they were seeing our results. Um, so if we choose this human accurately, we have human performance. But it turns out uh, that the group from Nascent that Jan was presenting yesterday came up with the algorithm that produces movement very close to what humans actually do. So you can see that, um, well, if you are not a biomechanist, you, you might say that it's actually how humans run. If you are a biomechanist, you will say that it's uh, completely not what humans do. But if you look on the data, you will see that the truth is somewhere in between. So what the data here shows is that how close are the simulations from our environment to real human running. So in the gray areas, you see the um, real experimental data of people just really running at certain speed. In the, the, and the black curves are the curves from our uh, competition. So these are the, the real observations from the, from the simulation. Now you see that those simulated curves are fairly close to actually what people do when running. The, the curves, again, re represent those joint angles that I was talking to you before. So something that biomechanics are, are super familiar with, and that's a convincing, a fairly convincing plot that we are, we are getting there. But why would we care about that, and how is it related to, to our Julie? So now imagine that I take this musculoskeletal model, I fit it exactly to dimensions of this little child, I train my models so that I represent the control or motor co cortex of Julie, so her brain or the part of the brain responsible for walking. If I have a perfect model that really uh, generates the same movement pattern, maybe if I simulate a surgery on the model, I will be able to predict how will she walk after surgery. So now imagine that I, in the model, in this uh, skeleton, I rotate one bone, I run like, my algorithm again, and I see that she walks better. That gives me some hope that this surgery could work. So I can try new surgeries that I wouldn't try before because there are, no, well, there are clear ethical reasons. You cannot just apply surgeries to Julie a uh, thousand times to experiment. 
don't want to do that. Julie one doesn't want to do that. But like on your model, if the model is accurate enough, you can go as wherever you want. You can try any surgery and get uh, hopefully meaning meaningful results. So as soon as those curves are really close to experimental data, or if they are really just by learning model from scratch, uh, we, we get close to experimental data, we have a method for predicting. We will have also the method for predicting surgery outcomes, which is remarkable. We're not yet there, but in a few years, it, it might happen, or 50 years. But uh, that's still exciting. So let me sum up. Um, I hope I convinced you uh, that it's an extremely exciting area to be right now in medical data and, and deep learning and machine learning. It can improve data collection, as Ayal was showing you just uh, half an hour ago. It can improve modeling, as Christopher Bishop and many people were showing you today. And then it, we, it can allow us to get outside of the box. It can allow us to really uh, design new treatments, design new therapies, because we can model humans within the computer, as, as Raya was showing you as well today. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Lucas.